Well, season two uh, is now done. Uh, in season two, Dan ends up snitching uh, on Hassan's character. And essentially, <laughs> Hassan ends up in his in his AA meetings after he already admitted to the group that he had snitched on someone. And so this whole like kind of uncomfortable like terror that kind of goes through that whole second season of like, you know, when is Drew going to find out about the snitching? And, yeah, and eventually, yeah. But there's some empathy you have for Dan. Even watching it, I'm not even as upset with Dan <laughs> as some of the shit that I've, I've been upset right. for Dan doing less, less than that. <laughs> You know what I'm Because yeah, I'm yeah. just like, oh, Dan's back is always against the fucking wall. <laughs> How the hell did fucking Douglas get him to snitch like that? How, why? All he had to do, no, I don't know who the guy was. There wasn't but, much he could do. He was too invested in his quarter water and snacks. <laughs> like, all you had to do, you could have you could have threw him way off and said, well, how are those take? You could have made any other reference to get him off your case because I was rooting for Dan and that scene so bad. But uh, that's that's cool. That's cool that you felt that way because <laughs> I'm looking at that scene, which is a, well, a tough scene to figure out how to do right. it, how to like break Seriously. down yeah. because it's, a shitty thing my character does, but also a, a, a big thing we're thinking about is like, how do we flip a lot of the stuff yeah, in the second like, season? What's from the, the first recourse season? and all this, kind right? Because the first season, Kevin uh, is dealing with the stress of Drew, and then my character is like, well, why don't you call the cops? Why don't right, you call the cops? Right. And Leave Kevin alone. Keep doesn't avoid do it. Him. Avoid him. He doesn't do it, and then everything blows up. Yeah. And so this season, it's like, okay, if we went the other way, what would happen? Well, everything would blow, blow up. up. <laughs> and so it just happens in a different way. And there's something very fun about my character who's desperate to get back to normalcy and 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 teach again and right. be back. But then once you get back in that institutional environment of like okay you're back here okay now do this thing you're uncomfortable with yeah and he's just tried he's just tried a season of completely lying and just fucking bullshitting and never worked never everybody worked everyone it. hated him everyone was mad at him so he's like okay i'll try this other way and then of course what's gonna happen you yeah know? well and then in the second season uh you finally get to meet your brother well drew's brother uh who's played by sticky fingers right so uh, yeah, they got to get black. My no, I mean, w which is dope. Which now you get another sort of you know seasoned actor in the mix that yeah, you know, a lot course. of hip hop people and I, know. And, I, and it's always the element surpri of, of surprise that you can appreciate. And I think Sticky's the perfect wild card for that because now here he is the more sensible out of the two. Right. Or at least seemingly so. Right. Yeah. So you're like, wait a minute now. This dynamic here is crazy because <laughs> wait, he's he's not as wild as Drew or wilder than Drew. Sticky fan because of what we know of him and his capabilities. But so now but that adds some other validity and to the art of the show now. Because then now it's kind of you're reeling it back in. It's like the sensibility of it is getting reeled back in a little bit. And you're like, all right, we got to figure out now where is this going? Because this was like veering off the track, kind of grabbed the wheel back, caught it. Now let's see if, you know, we can stay on the course. And I think that's what's interesting because as soon as he comes in, it's like it's over. It was like this, this thing where like, oh, okay, you getting comfortable now. Right. Oh, Zayna, dad's, dad's home. Okay. Right. Cross your legs now and see. And then it's like, <laughs> oh, okay, we got to wait now. We're in for some more. So I think that was a great nuance for the second season, for the finale, especially. And that, and that scene, there's a scene in the last episode. Uh, the season finale, season two, where you and uh, uh, Hassan and Sticky Fingers are kind of go at each other. Right. And that's such a good, the two of them, it feels very real. And it, it's cool to see, you don't, you haven't really seen anybody talk to yeah, Drew, Drew that like way. That. Yeah, right. and that's so, what that did for me so as well. It's just fun seeing this character we've seen for 20 episodes yep. and see him in a new context. Yep. And we haven't seen him like react that way yep. where, you know, you've seen Zayna get mad at Drew. And so you see that kind of disappointment, but to see like, oh, this is his brother. This is somebody who has every reason to be frustrated yeah. that, that Drew can't play the, like, I'm an adult. Yeah, I know what's best. Work with no. Him. Exactly. So it's just this different element yep. and, and the Rainbow. two of them played it really, really well. Yeah. So is there a third season? We're not sure. So if people, if people want it. You know, you know what I'm say saying? so. Say so, exactly. Just keep asking and, you know, request, be on a request line live. Uh, asking, <laughs> asking, ye maybe shall receive. <laughs> you know, you know, it's like that. <laughs> well, Hassan, I want to get uh, into your story as well. Mm -hmm. So 
you actually uh, grew up in uh, Park Hill, Staten Island? Yeah, Park Hill, Staten Island, yep. By way of Coney Island. So, like Dan was saying, it's like these, like how Flatbush and, you know, any way you go or just living in, mm -hmm. you know, Upper East Side and then yep. you have friends here and there. I think I had the best of both worlds as well because, you know, Coney Island is like another whole world. It's not even Brooklyn as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, no, no, no. And then Staten <laughs> Island is the forgotten fifth borough, right? I call that down south New York. <laughs> yeah. It is. And then so, I, I, but I've had the best of all. I wouldn't trade anything for it. I wouldn't trade it for the world. Because, you know, I went to school in Staten Island. I spent my, my weekends in Coney Island. So there was that, you know, that Staten Island, Brooklyn boy. Like, you know, everybody knew that on Staten Island I was from Brooklyn because I was always, my family was still there. But my immediate family was in Staten Island. So um, that that's the dynamic for me. So when Flatbush comes along, of course, I'm like, I'm all in. I'm getting to work in my backyard. I don't think anybody could do this better than I can. So like, hence Dan saying, ah, oh, fuck that shit. I'm too good. <laughs> Just put this Zoom call. You was right. You know? He was totally right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I was like, I, I got this covered and some other, but yeah, I'm a Staten Islander. That's right. Park Hill. Grew up with meth, Ray. <laughs> Uh, you God, right? Because then Jizza and all of them dirty was from Brooklyn. They used to come over and hang out. But yeah, Park Hill, home of the Wu Tang. Right. And I mean, I've interviewed a bunch of the Wu Tang members before. I mean, what was it like? Because, you know, like you said, Staten Island is like the forgotten borough. Mm -hmm. And there really hasn't been any big stars to have come out of Staten Island until Wu Tang, right. who became one of the biggest stars with you know the most famous logo in hip hop. Yeah, I mean, so what was on. it like being in that and just seeing like that blow up? I mean, it was great for me. I mean, because I mean, before that, I think it was like, who was from Staten Island? I think Steven Seagal. <laughs> right, we were we were happy. Like well, Steven Seagal lives by the wall. Like yeah, was, that was, was the point of yeah, pride. That, that, that was the highlight for us in school. But, but no, but you, but you right though, Vlad. Like. It was, it was something special because um, I used to hang out outside and my cousin, you know, God rest his soul, his name was Ryan. They called him each. He was best friends with Divine and RZA. And I think mm. when Meth came from Long Island, he introduced Method Man to RZA. And then they started off, you know, figuring out what, what it is they wanted to do with themselves and rapping became the, the, uh, the, the outcome. But I knew there was something special about Method Man for sure. And uh, it was just something about him because he was a tree. He was tall as a tree, lanky, jovial, big right. kid. Meth's this big kid. You know what I mean? But he had something. And then him and Ugar used to always rap at the Chinese restaurant around the corner from our building on Tarji Street. And it would be Ugar beatboxing or, you know, you know, on the on the counter of the restaurant. And then Meth would be rapping. And then it's just the stuff he was saying. And how he was saying it with this ashy ass voice was just incredible. And then I was just like, with, I, and I know in my mind, I was saying if the rest of the world gets to hear this, they'll, they won't forget about us no more. Cause we were outside just like, ain't nobody worried about what's going right. on out here. <laughs> you know, but you're hearing about all the stuff in Harlem and Queens and Brooklyn. You hearing about all the, the, the players and the drug deal, you know, all that. And we had our fair share. We did, but it was still, just because we were over that water, over that bridge, and it's a suburb, primarily it's a suburb, right? Seven out of ten people there are Trump supporters. You know what I mean? Just to get the just to get the gist of what's going on. So yeah, that's what that's what we were dealing with. A lot of racism, but not, you know, nothing to even like, not Mississippi burning racism, but enough that it was it was a taste on your tongue. I mean, mm -hmm. shit, one of my childhood friends got ran over by a car coming from Rosebank. It was a neighborhood called Rosebank down the street from Park Hill. Now, you could walk. We used to cut through these woods to walk there. There was a school, PS13, we played at. Now, some of the kids went to school there from the neighborhood. I didn't. I went to PS11 in Stapleton. But there were always those racial, you know, tensions and stuff like that because the schools are in the suburbs. It's like we have our neighborhoods, our inner city, our neighborhoods, our projects, but we go to school in the suburbs. So we had to deal with that and it became second nature. And I I love where I'm from. I I it didn't I didn't get bit, it didn't turn me bitter. I just I saw it what it for what it was. It was like some people are gonna like you, some people ain't. Right. And that's just the way it is. <laughs> right. For whatever reason, whether you tall, short, black, white, 
or other. So I think that's why I say it was the best of both worlds growing up for me, because then I got to, you know, really ride that wave and that fine line. Like I could have one foot in, one foot out in a good way. You know what I'm saying? And um, I think that's what made me a survivor for in Park Hill and in the rest of the city as well, because I could just blend in and adapt. You could go to the Coney Island. The- Coney Island Cyclone, yeah, or be close to Steven Seagal. Go on, right, either way, <laughs> it both was, You know yeah. what I'm saying? That one, either end of the spectrum, it was happening. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, now thank God for that. Well, you're going to high school, and I guess someone dared you to audition for Clockers. Yes, that is the story. So I was a football player, and then I was in this this program at Port Richmond High School called PRISM. Okay. Everybody thought it's, it was PRISM, because if you say it, but it was PRISM, P-R-I-S-M. So it was Port Richmond, Port Richmond Institute of Science and Math. So my mother did everything in her soul and fiber to make sure I had the best education I could, because she knew that was nothing else for me to make it in life except have a better education. Young, black, you know, struggling. You got the odds against you. You know the story. All right, so you got to go out double, triple times as much as everybody else to get what you need, just to be on the even kill. And I was like, she always put that in me and understood that. So I went to school. I never cut class a day in my life. Never ditched or cut class a day in my life from kindergarten to 12th grade because I was scared Francis would find out and I'd be dead. So she put (laughs) that fear in my heart that kept me on easy street. So, you know, I saw it. I excelled in school. That wasn't nothing. I played ball. I thought I was going to be a baller. But the day I fucked my ball career up. Because what happened was I got dared to go, right? So Ariana, there was this girl. She was so smart. And my boy Tristan was dating her. And she was like, all right, well, mister, I want to be on TV. Because I guess that's all I ever (laughs) expressed that I wanted to do with myself in life. Besides the academics and the the sports. (laughs) She said, I dare you to go to this clock. It's all just Spike Lee's having an open call. And, you know, back then it was just a straight Xerox copy, black and white, no right. full color, nothing fancy. And so I was at lunch at the time. And I remember looking around, everybody at the lunch table and asked, well, she want me to go to this audition. Who coming with me? And then everybody did one of these things and kind of looked away and scratched their head. So I said, all right, I folded the piece of paper up. I put it in my back pocket. I went home. It was a weekend, the audition, and it was raining. <laughs> so I was bored. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I said, wait a minute, that thing's the day. <laughs> Jumped up, checked my pants pocket. Oh, I got time. Yeah. Got on the Staten Island Ferry, just like I did to come yeah, here. God damn. Got yeah. on the ferry, took the train up, and it was in Harlem, I believe, the school. I can't remember what school it was, and I went. Long story short, I got picked out of the audience. I went back to the audition. Aisha Coley was the casting director. She took my Polaroid, gave me this information sheet, where to go. And I went, and the rest is history. Now, eight callbacks later, Spike had his work tooth and nail. I mean, eight callbacks. Eight callbacks. Damn. And I didn't get the lead role because it was for Strike that that was played by Makai Pfeiffer. But they still made an offer. And I remember on the phone because what happened was I came home and my dad was like. If you don't call them 40 acres and the mule people back, man, they've been calling here all day. I was like, 40 acres and a mule? Oh, that's Spike Lee. So she's like, we fought hard. We wanted you for the lead role, Oz, but it didn't work out. But Spike still wants you to be in the film. And I'm like, hell yeah. This is the first movie you ever auditioned first for? First movie I ever auditioned for, crazy. man, at, a, at an open call. I yeah. got in there, principal character, principal role. We worked, we started the day after the 4th of July, the summer of 1994. And we rapped like two days before school started. Right. So I didn't go to football camp that summer. Damn. My coach yeah. didn't start me for the first three games. Right. So whoever he did start in my position got hurt. I went in and ended up doing my thing. But all the little prospects, the uh, the the, bat, the football letters and stuff like that, my coach didn't help me fill out, get back to them and stuff like that. You know, you the coach and, and the student, Man, you got to walk him through the whole thing. I bet he's reached out since. Yeah, I bet like, he did. I always knew. I always knew you were a talent. And yeah. Coach Perich, man, oh. you came from Madison, too. You, you coached at Madison High School in Brooklyn and you came to Staten Island. And you messed up my dreams, man, but I still Fuck made you. it. That's, that's, your, that's a Michael Jordan Hall of Fame speech. Yes. Where you fly, fly the, fly the <laughs> yep. high school coach yep. there and yep. be like, you fucked up. You fucked up. Not me, you did. 
<laughs> look at you now. Yeah, look at me. <laughs> nobody, nobody started over you as playing in the NFL. And after that, right? <laughs> and you are still acting. And, and, and that's what's so funny because, you know, I, I finished my high school career out, right? And I started acting. So then when I graduated, and I see friends from school, and I tell them, because we know you come back from school that mm -hmm. same year for that September. Yeah. Like, what did you do? And then yeah, yeah. most kids, they went to Florida. They went to, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Disney. Yeah, they worked at Blockbuster, like yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you go visit your family members. Right. I did a movie, but nobody's, like, believing <laughs> or jacking that shit. Right. It's like, what were you, uh, an extra hot? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> but then when Clockers comes out and everything, and then I do New York Undercover was like the first thing after Clockers that I did. Then it was Law and Order, and it was all the guest star roles on all the t television shows that they did in New York City, NYPD mm -hmm. Blue, you name it. It was like, oh, you wasn't bullshitting, you were serious. I'm hit him with the emoji. <laughs> I mean, I tried to tell you, you know. I asked, matter of fact, a couple of you guys to come with me. <laughs> you didn't want to go. Right, right. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying. You know, that? The I'm doing could've... interviews with Dan and Vlad. I'm just saying. <laughs> That's how the shit go. First audition. <laughs> first audition, man. The first audition I ever went on, the casting person was like, are you an actor? And I was like, no, I do comedy. And he, and he was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, if you would have just said, no, yeah, I'm in that. He yeah, knew. Right he was like, why am I looking at you? Because it's not because of what you just it's did. Right. You got to be good at something yeah, else. Yeah, right. And I just want to know what. what? It is. But it ain't acting. It's not this. Right, thank you. Okay, got it. <laughs>